Joe White, so you see the screen again? Yeah. Go. Thank you. Go ahead and start whenever you're ready. Yeah, and that's, that's, I don't know if you can get the projector in better or not. Unfortunately, the projector's not very good, so. All right, we'll leave it as it is. Good morning, everyone. I'm Bruce K1BG. Uh, here to talk a little bit about CW Academy. Just a quick poll. How many people have come here today because they want to learn the Morse code? How many are here because you want to become more proficient at Morse code? Okay. And how many are interested in actually helping other people learn the Morse code? Good. So we'll talk a little bit about, about all of this and about the different, the different programs. Just a, as a side note, a quick question. How many of you were licensed 1976 or before? Okay. <laughs> I assume I know I'm gonna, I, I know the answer, but I always ask the question, how many of you were 18 years of age or younger when you were first married? Uh, first uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> first parent. <laughs>
Um, the beginner's level, most of my students go on to the higher levels of classes that the <laughs> Academy offers. Um, class days depend on the, the uh, advisor uh, who is teaching the class. Four or five students per class. I've had as many as seven in the class. I've had as few as one in my class. And that person was very, very fortunate because she got my entire attention and, uh, and she did very, very well. Uh, I don't know about you, but typically I kind of look the good stuff cheap. And so this is one of the benefits of the, of the class. This is done purely on, on a voluntary. So, what method do we use to teach in Morse, Morse code? Uh, I'm an advisor, I lead the class. We don't call ourselves teachers because teachers typically teach the, the material. With CW Academy, each student is given a course program. They're expected to follow the program and then we review the material. So instead of teaching it and having them go and practice it, they practice it and then we review after. And we look for um, problems the students are having, challenges the students are having. There's a whole range of different things that we see. Morse is always sent in at least 20 words per minute. And in fact, I tend to start my, my students at 23 words per minute. And there's good reason for doing this. One of, the, one of the things that will slow down the learning process is if the students start focusing on other things than just listening to the sound. And we were talking earlier today about um, learning by just focusing on the sound. And it turns out that if you start sending at slower speeds, you start thinking about other things. You may start thinking that a beat is three bits in a dot rather than a big B being it is a dot, okay? Um, and actually, other crazy things online. You know, learn Morse code and they'll show you a flow chart, right? And if it's a div, it's an E, or it's the other side of the flow chart, right? And this may be great for a computer program, which is running at a phenomenal speed, but you can't keep up with slow Morse code by looking through a flow chart, okay? And the same thing is true with these word association games or these sound association games. It might have been good in the old days to get your five word per minute, okay? But it's not going to help you in becoming an actual uh, CW operator. So we tend to focus on sending um, text at 20 words per minute or faster. We use Fern's word, which means we put space between the characters. So my students start out at an effective speed of four or five words per minute. Okay? And we try to build the speed as we go. But the letters are sent faster so that you get used to the sound at the higher speed so that you can progress more easily to the higher speed. Um, we emphasize sending as well as receiving characters. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about this, but sending tends to be um, important in the learning process, and we feel that's important. I will tell you with my students, the ones that learn to send effectively are usually the ones that are the better students when it comes to receiving the code. So the actual sending in practice helps them with the learning process. We introduce letters in groups, so every week there will be new letters introduced. They're introduced uh, in the order in which they're used in the English language. So for instance, uh, the first week is uh, T-E-A-N-N, okay, which if you think, uh, if you already know Morse code, these are the shortest letters in the Morse code, right? T is just da, E is just dit, okay? You can't get any shorter than those letters. And the same thing A-N-N, da da and da dit, okay? So, um, the, they're, they're, we learn in the order, you know, I think the last, the last session is like X, Y, and Z or something like that. Um, and the focus, we focus on something called instant character recognition, which is hard to teach. But um, if you're sending the letters at 20 words per minute, like the farm's word is five words per minute, the faster you can recognize the letter, essentially, the less space you put between those characters, and so you can. Okay. 
By the way, if there's any questions, we have a small group here, so feel free to raise your hand. Go ahead. Um, you mentioned Farnsworth. Don't know what that is. And secondly, um, in the wild, what's the typical rate at which people send or is it variable? Is there standard? Great question. So Farnsworth is where you send the letter at a higher speed, but you increase the time between the letters that you send. So when I learned, I wish I had brought a peer with me, when I learned the old five words per minute, if say you were talking about the letter C, the letter C is dotted dot. So if you were sending it on the air at five words per minute, it would go da dit, da dit. Whereas at 20 words per minute, it's more like da da da. Okay? But you increase the time between the letters. So you have more time available for you to do your character recognition, but you also learn the character at the higher speed. If you get on the air, you'll hear people code speeds all over the place. You'll hear people five, six, seven words per minute, sometimes using Farnsworth, sometimes not using Farnsworth. You will hear what they call QRQ, which is the code symbol for, um, if you say QRQ, question mark, is shall I go faster? If you just say QRQ, it's go faster, but the QRQ guys, I don't know, 50, 60 words per minute. Once, once they're past where I can copy, once they're past where I can copy, I really don't care. It's kind of like teletype. So yeah, and, and what, but what's also what's also funny is that you know when I was learning as a kid, I would hear this code. It was like intimidating, and frightening, and now not so much anymore because of, you know because my skills improved. Um, you know, it's like if you've ever listened to somebody speaking a foreign language, you hear them going, and it's like absolute gibberish. But if you study a foreign language and you learn it, all of a sudden you start recognizing the words and sounds and what it is. And so um, you basically learn it, right? So um, I don't know if that answered your question or not. It did. Um, do you get to the point where you can listen to it and just know what it is without having to write it down? So one of the things that we try to uh, focus on is, is something called head copy. And, and so typically I only write down the information I want to say. So uh, when I, I keep a log book, and so I'll write down the uh, pertinent information for the content that I have, the, the time, the frequency, the call sign, those kinds of things, the super report. I'll write down the person's name, I'll write down their location, and then anything else that might be interesting during the course of a conversation. So if they tell me what their equipment is, I'll write that down. If they tell me what the weather is, you know, if you talk to them again in two years, you might be interested in knowing what they're using for equipment in two years, but there's no real point going back to what the weather was two years ago, right? So, but the focus is on head copy and conversation with most of them. Okay. By the way, this is a little bit different than the way the code was taught 50 years ago. It was taught more for preparing, preparing you to go into the military or one of the commercial services where you wrote everything down, right? So. There's a lot of random five-letter character groups, that kind of thing. Um, so it's a little bit different than, than the way um, it used to be taught. So what do you need to participate? Um, you need a, uh, what's called a paddle, okay, which is different than a straight key. You need something to generate the sound so that when you're actually sending the code, you can hear what it is you're sending. So you need a hear or a trans uh, a hear or a transceiver that has an internal hear, something where you can turn the power level of the transceiver off so you're just hearing the side tone. You need a computer uh, because these uh, programs have done this program is done um, on the air using Zoom or one of the one of the uh, different uh, teleconference um, applications out there. You need a webcam and a microphone, and you need good internet access. Okay. I had a student who struggled um, 
was trying to work on a Wi-Fi hotspot because he lived in an area that had no commercial uh, internet service. Um, and it was challenging, but in the end it worked. But I recommend good internet service. Okay, always get the question, what if I want to use a straight key? Okay, there's lots of different theories on this. Um, originally with CW Academy, it was done all on a straight key. Okay, and we found over time that what happens when you use a straight key, you typically send much slower, okay? And the students start focusing on counting the dots and dashes and not listening to the sound, okay? Anybody who's trying using the straight key at 20 words per minute for a long period of time will find that basically you get carpal tunnel syndrome, your, your pan wants to fall off, okay? It's really hard to do. So I tell people, you know, this is kind of a trap. Um, if you want to learn quickly, if you want to get to speed quickly, we recommend doing this with a, a peer. Um, could you explain the difference between the straight key and the paddle? Sure. Let me see if I can find it. So here's here's a uh, paddle. So a straight key, a straight key is a, basically a manual switch where it's an up and down motion. Yeah. A paddle is a side to side motion where you make dots on one side and dashes on the other. So if you hold this, it goes did 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 If you hold it to the other side, it goes da 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 And if you want to make a character, you go back and forth. Okay? Can you configure which side is which? You can. Um, the the um, um, accepted um, standard for this is that your thumbs make this, and your index finger makes dots. Okay. Um, having said that, um, this is typically true right-handed people. This goes back to the old mechanical bugs, which I don't want to get into. But mechanical bugs were only made one way. They were made for right-handed operators. If you were left-handed, it was like learning to play guitar. A left-handed person learning to play guitar on a right-handed guitar. Right. You just hold it upside down. The same thing happened, and there were also lots of hands in the old days. They would learn to send, they were right handed, they would learn to send. They found out that if they were in a contest, they want to send in the left hand while they're writing with their right hand, right? Because they're entering information in the logbook but sending at the same time. So they would just move it over. But typically, the um, accepted standard is it's with your thumb, dashes with your index. So the four levels of CW Academy. The beginner level is developed with pure beginners in mind. Okay, no previous Morse code uh, experience or proficiency. Sometimes we get people in there that have learned it before, but are a little bit rusty, or there's really slow speed. They say, "Well, I you know really don't want to kind of venture out and do the higher speed uh, the next class up." But it's really people who have no experience. I've had students come to me uh, and enroll in my class. I give them a quick test and I say, forget about it. You should be in the next class up, the basic class. Uh oh. Does that change? Yeah, it changes. We're working on this. While he's solving your technical problem, um, I've read that um, I've read that uh, Morse code, the way that you send it, ends up being a very tight sort of squirt of data, so it goes further, uh, or you can do it with 
less power? Is that, is that actually true? Okay, so um, think of you know, your voice. If you looked at, at your voice spectrum, mm -hmm. okay, it occupies, again, depending on the quality, if you were like a hi fi enthusiast, you want your speakers to go any, anywhere from like low frequency up to about 20 kilohertz, right? Mm -hmm. And you notice that when you do that, people not only sound perfect, but the orchestra sounds perfect. Yes. Right? If you listen on a telephone, okay, there you only have a few kilohertz of bandwidth, which is why your telephone doesn't sound nearly as good as what you listen to like on a Zoom presentation, right? Yeah. So typically sideband transceivers okay, have filters that are, let's say, two point, two and a half, two point eight kilohertz. Okay. Whereas a CW signal is just a few tens of hertz in band. So if you have a 100 watt transceiver, instead of spreading that power over 2.8 kilohertz, now all of spreading that power over 40 or 50 hertz. So the signal will go a lot further because your signal to noise ratio is much better. Okay. Plus, for me, from a pure interference point of view, if you're listening on one frequency and you have five people calling you on sideband, all five of those voice signals are occupying exactly the same bandwidth. Okay? If you listen on Morse code, okay, each of those signals are on a slightly different frequency and sound slightly different. So your ear is able to separate them or you can put narrow filtering in your transceiver separate out the signal set one. So, so Morse code will go consider, considerably further than, a, than a, the same signal side band. Well, and that's because you're able to concentrate the output of your radio, of your tra <coughs> transmitter. The power is just on a CW signal. It's just more concentrated. Yeah. And correct. Yeah. I think the main thing is your receiver, if you have the capability of narrowing that received uh, a can advance signal that's going to go pass to your audio amplifier. You're not hearing anything on either side of that very narrow K on the hertz wide signal. And not all radios are able to do that. Right. No. Yeah. Oh. So yeah. plus yeah. some yeah. some receivers have notch filters okay. so that if there's a really strong right. Right. signal that is next to where you are wanting to listen, you can notch that one out. Gotcha. All right. Because you really only want to hear that one, which is like you said, transmitting very narrow band. Well, that's, that's good to know. So if I go, so you got to pick the receiver and care one that can do that. So you got to pick the receiver carefully. Selectivity is the number. So, so the answer is yes. If you buy the first radio and you intend to use CW, you should buy one. You should buy one that either has an optional or built in filtering capability. The newer ones do it using digital signal processing. The older radios have crystal filters. Um, so, okay. Thank you. Um, when the audio filters are misleading, they're useful, but if you have a, a receiver whose IF bandwidth is wide and you can't narrow it down to that few hertz that you want to eliminate the other guys, and it does make it sound different, okay? Uh, but if you need to eliminate those guys, you narrow the receiver bandwidth down. If you don't do that, if your receiver still has a little wide bandwidth and you want to add an audio filter, the receiver is still receiving those strong signals that you don't want to hear, and sometimes they'll overload the receiver, so you still got to be careful. So for all levels of, of CW Academy, there's a lesson guide that's provided. For the beginner level, there are 16 lessons and each lesson has the new letters that are being introduced and has practice words and things for uh, practicing. There's also an online um, program called Morse Code Trainer, which is, is automated. And when you go into the um, Morse Code Trainer system, it will send you the particular new letters for that week's lesson. Okay? We're talking here now at the beginner level. So if you're the first week and it's T E A and N, it goes through and sends you to the letters, get used to the get you used to the sound. 
gets used to the proper spacing, and then, you know, uh, it starts sending you words, and you've got to copy those words, T and 10 and eat. There's only so many words you can do with four letters, right? You know? Um, so, and then when you go to the second week, it's the same thing, and it's a progression. And they not only teach you the new letters, but the words that they go over a combination of the new letters plus the letters before, right? You learn all of the letters by session 10. And after session 10, between session 10 and session 16, the end of the, um, the uh, beginner level, we go over different on-the-air operating uh, types of things. So we talk about how a basic CW contact works, okay? How you call CQ, how you answer CQ, what information you send back and forth, the kinds of things you can talk about, how you end a contact. All of these things come into play. We talk about if somebody is a DX station or on a DX tradition, how do you talk to somebody who's on a DX tradition where the conditions are a little bit different? In the first case, you're carrying on a conversation. In the second case, um, the guy may be operating on an island uh, close to Antarctica. He's only there for two or three days and he wants to get as many people in the logbook as possible. So you don't want to start sending him your name and the weather and what kind of rig you have, right? So you explain to the students, you know, what the correct operating procedure is. We talk about contesting, we talk a little bit about traffic handling. So that we do in the last six sessions. And the focus is getting the students on the air. I know this is a room full of adults, okay? I tell my, particularly my adult students, the expectation is, is after week 10, you will get on the air. And I want that commitment from you. And they all say, oh, Bruce, absolutely. I don't want to take your course. I'll give you that commitment. You get to week 10, they learn the Morse code. They're actually pretty good at it. And in fact, after week 10, they are better than I was when I first got on the air. Um, because they not only know all the letters, but they know them at speed. Whereas I was just, I used to have a cheat sheet when I first got on the air for the punctuation and the numbers that I didn't have memorized yet, right? Adults, not, not always, but it's typical with adults. So the expectation now is that you'll get on the air. Well, you know, I'm not comfortable. Um, you know, I don't want to get on the air at five words per minute. When I get to eight words per minute, I'll get on the air. So you go to week 12, and they're at eight, nine words per minute, and it's like, Time for you to get on the air. Oh, I'm, com I'm not comfortable. I hear all these guys, you know, 20, 30, 40 words per minute. Uh, I'm not comfortable. To okay, you know, so when are you going to get on? Well, when I get the 12 words per minute. And then they'll come back a week later and they'll say, Bruce, I signed up for the basic class, which is the next class. And I'll say, well, you may have signed up for the class, okay, but there's an expectation that you're going to be on the air, okay, using that. My youth students never have this problem, okay? They want to jump out of that nest as fast as they possibly can, okay? So it's kind of a little bit different thing, but if you're going to take CW Academy and you're a licensed radio amateur and you have the equipment at home, there's an expectation that you're going to use it on the air, and I encourage you, the easiest way to break the ice, okay, is to do this. Because once you're using it on the air, it ceases to become a school with practice and all of these things. You start enjoying amateur radio and you start enjoying the Morse code. So I encourage everybody to do this. All of us who are CW operators, okay, all have to make that first contact, okay. We were all nervous when we did it, okay. And when we're working with other people, I love working with people just getting on the air. It's, I, I tell people, it's like watching my kids and my grandkids learn how to walk, okay? And if, if any CW operator tells you that they get on the air and they don't make mistakes, they're lying, okay? Because if you're using a paddle, you make mistakes all the time, okay? And it's just the way that it is. You should not be afraid to get on the air and use this no matter what speed you Okay, what's expected to succeed? You're expected to attend the sessions. You're 
expected to practice 45 minutes to an hour every day. The secret to learning Morse code is to practice a little bit every day. The secret to not learning Morse code, okay, is to just say, I'm not going to do the work, okay? It requires some discipline. I've had numerous students tell me, Bruce, I thought I would never be able to learn the code. I tried learning the code three, four, five times and I always fail. Why is this different? The answer is peer pressure, okay? We have a group of people, four or five people, learning the code at the same time. You're expected to practice every day. Some of the students will pair off and, and practice with each other on the days when we're not having class. If you do a little bit of work every day, you will learn the more stuff. So um, the end goal of the beginner level, you basically learn the code, right? Letters, numbers, punctuation, prosigns on certain uh, characters that are used in the course of making uh, contacts. Um, we talked a little earlier about instant character recognition. We kind of do introduction to instant character rec recognition. That's what we're working on. We talked during the class about CW operating uh, procedure. So once you've learned the letters, you get on the air, you understand the procedure and making a contact, and you've got all the skills you need to basically get on the air and make contact. That's the end of the beginning of life. Can you describe the character recognition and then, like, elevator pitch? Yeah, so if you ever, uh, uh, in school, study, like, a foreign language, so, if you learn like a, an individual word, you start thinking, what's, what, is, what is that word? Okay, what's the translation, right? Once you become fluent in the language, you recognize the word instantly, right? Okay. That makes sense. And with the Morse code, it's the same thing. If you get out of it, my students will think from that L, okay? Whereas when I hear get out of it, it's L, okay? That's all instant character recognition is. I can't explain it any other way. It's the time, it's the time from when you hear the character, when you hear the sound, to when you recognize what it is. Okay. All right. So um, the basic level is the second level up. If you know all the characters and the numbers, go ahead. The star is getting on the air. How about groups like Thomas and Ground Up at the Great 20th Century Club or Andre with Slow Speed Nets? Any of those things are great for getting on the end. Okay? Um, the first things you talked about are operating activities. Okay? Um, whereas a slow speed traffic net is typically handling, handling traffic. Okay? But all of those things are good things for, for practicing the code. I'm not sure what the question was, and more of my answer. Yeah, I was just like pointing out things where it like, might be more comfortable for people to get on the air with you there. Getting in the group that are kind of made for people who are just starting on slow way. So, so again, um, my advice is you get on the air and you call CQ with the speed you're comfortable at, and people will answer you or should answer you I had, um, I'm gonna run short of time here or not. Um, I had the most amazing thing last year. I've been a hand now for 53 years. I actually had a guy call me last week, call me back very slowly. First contact he ever made on the air. Okay, this was this was on on more stuff. Okay, and I immediately turned my speed down to match his speed, and he was at like nine or ten words per minute. And we not only had a great conversation, and he came back and said it was his first contact, but he's been on the air like every day. He's been regularly on the air ever since. So um, there's many different ways to like use the Morse code. Okay. Um, it, it, the, the important thing is that you make the effort to do it. You have to make an effort to do it um, because. Um, it's not going to happen just by itself. Okay. So, all right, the basic level is the second level. So when my students finish with my class, 
they typically sign up for the next class up, which is the basic level. Um, this is for you if you know all the characters and numbers, but your speed isn't really kind of where you want it to be, uh, or you want to improve your speed, right? So if you are just at the point where you where you've got the letters and numbers, but not really progressed much past that, um, you want to be at the basic level. And again, um, they focus on uh, better head copy, better instant character recognition, um, increasing your skills. And again, it's 16 online sessions, and they do focus on on-the-air contact. And that's between members of the class, but also focus on the students going out and making contacts every week. QSO is? QSO is, anyone, um, I know you, you're new, so go back to like the days of Titanic when you had ships at sea and operators, none of the operators spoke necessarily the same language. They developed these signals called Q signals. Okay? So if you say QTH question mark, QTH in the question mark means what is your location? Okay. If you say QTH Boston Mass, that means my location is Boston Mass. Okay. Right? Um, so QSO is a contact. Okay. okay. That's all that, that all means. So increased skills for on the air conversational contact. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, the third level up is the intermediate level, and I should point out that it used to be there was no basic level. You went basically from the beginner right to the intermediate. We found that it was too big a jump for a lot of students, and so they created this level just to like reinforce the things that were taught in the basic level. Intermediate level, the code speed's between 10 and 15 words per minute, and you've got some decent character recognition. This is kind of where you want to be. Uh, class objectives are more of the same, right? You know, increase your head copy skills. You start to recognize words as sounds. I'll talk about this separately in a minute. Uh, RUFZ and Morse Runner are two programs that run under Windows, two separate programs. And they're really good at developing skills. I tell people, you know, if you're a pilot, um, you can get a lot of experience by flying airplanes, but you can also get a lot of experience in a flight simulator. And think of these programs as being like a flight simulator. They kind of push you, okay? Um, I've had young students of mine hate these programs because even if you're a guy who can operate Morse code at 80 words per minute, these programs, particularly RUFZ, RUFZ adapts to your speed, and it will keep increasing until you can't use it anymore, okay? And the kids in particular find this very unsettling because they feel that they fail, okay? And my response is, no, you've succeeded, okay? But anyway. Um, Are they only Windows-based, or do they run on Mac? These particular programs, I believe, are Windows based. Uh, I know they're Windows based. I know there are I don't know that much about Mac, but I know there are programs on the Mac where you can run window programs oh, yeah. under them kind of thing. And there is some success in doing this. And there are some other programs that are similar. So okay. Bruce, we have a question from a Zoom participant. It says it's clarify I'm left handed. Should I use it here with my left hand? Alternate goal is contact. Okay, uh, it's a good question. So, and this is kind of something we talked about earlier. Uh, the um, standard is that you make dits with your thumb and dots with your index finger. Okay? In the old days, everything was geared towards being a right handed operator because you had things like mechanical bugs that only came one way. Okay? What we generally advise now is that you use the same standard for um, for if you're left-handed as if you're right-handed. So you do dits with your thumb, dits with your thumb, dashes with your index finger. I think the question was if you're trying to do the PDX or if you're trying to, I mean, if you're trying to do contest and you're trying to copy, should you try to learn the key with your left hand so your boss hand? So that's that's a 
Vatican is a little bit different. In the old days, that was important. People who were right-handed would learn how to send on their left hand so they could copy with their right hand. These days, in contesting, um, computers okay, have made contesting really exciting because you don't have to do the logging by paper anymore. Okay? But it also means that you can get the computer to actually send the Morse code for you while you are operating. Okay, so there it's less of a skill that people learn these days. Okay, sending with the left left hand. It's kind of been kind of been negated with uh, with uh, the modern computer skills because you're using the computer to send rather than keying in. Correct. Right. You're still copying the Morse code by listening to it because these computer programs are not good at copying. For a lot of different reasons. Um, so you're still copying the code, but for instance, if I'm in a contest and I call CQ and I get a call from W1XX, I put W1XX into my log, okay, and I hit a character and the computer says W1XX with the report, right? And I don't have to manually do that anymore. I typically do. I have a paddle set up where if there's mistakes, if he asks for repeats, or if it's somebody I know, I'll say, hi Bob, how are you? Right? Okay. But um, but you don't you don't have to uh, do that when you're contesting. So but again, the, the rule of the, the general rule is if you're setting up your paddles and your keyer, your thumb makes dips, your index finger makes stops. What if you let me? Same, same thing, same thing. Oh, you can do it with your left hand. You use your left hand to send. Sure. All right. Yeah. Um, and then finally, the advanced level, if you're up to like 50, 20 words per minute, and you want to develop your skills from that point, um, the advanced level is for you. Again, the secret to all of these is you got to do a little bit every day. And so 45 minutes to an hour every day is what's expected of all of the students. Many advanced course graduates become CW Ops members. The youngest member of CW Ops in the country now is Wesley WA7KDI. He's a former student of mine. He's 12 years old. He's an absolute great operator, okay? Um, he gets into contests, he does uh, on the air contacts, and he's got a million other things going on as well that he's into. But um, uh, I've got another student who's just newly licensed. She's now 11 years old. She was 10 when she took my class. She's getting in all the all the contests that are out there. She's having a class. So, um, so um, they all progressed through this, and a lot of the. Um, uh, graduates of the advanced class level become CW Ops members. Um, a number, I've had a number of former students who are now teaching, or I should say, advising classes, which for me is even better because this is like this is like watching your your off, offspring, you know, multiply, right? You know, so for each student that I taught, they're like now helping other students and and really uh, advancing this. You have a question. CW Ops, what is it? Why would one want to become a member and what are the requirements for doing so? Okay, so CW Ops is a club. I talked about it like at the very beginning. Uh, it's a CW or Morse code um, operating focused club. It's been around for about 10 years. There's like 3,000 members. Um, it's something that you're expected to be able to carry on a conversation. 25 words per minute, okay, and you are asked uh, to join the club. Um, so if you get on the air regularly, um, somebody sooner or later will ask you to join the club. It's not, it's not, you know, some people say, well, it sounds like an exclusive club. It's not really. Um, and the reason I say that is because we're always being pushed, you know, who have you found this month kind of thing? Who have you asked this month kind of thing? We want more and more people. And it's more focused to kind of preserving Morse code as an operating activity and an operating skill. 
and that's out of CW, the CW Ops is called the CW Academy, but there are a, a number of other great things. Every Wednesday there are three one-hour operating activities called the CW, the CW Keys. The one-hour little uh, contests that go on, and they're quite popular. People, a lot of people get on three times. Well, they're now four times uh, every Wednesday. One is geared towards uh, uh, the U.S. time zone. One geared towards Europe. One geared towards it, towards Asia. And there's been a, a fourth one that's been added. So. Um, um, it's a it's, it's a great organization to belong to, and I particularly like it um, because of CW Academy, because of the focus on bringing new new people into into the Morse code operator. Bruce, uh, on that note, if you think 40 meters is dead or some band is dead, and you're doing the math from signals, and the CWT CW test comes on the air. And, and I think it's band limited, right? It's only a certain there's a segment. General, there's a general area. It's right. not limited, right. but it is a, there is a focus. All of a sudden, your S meter goes from S3 up to 20, 30, 40 dB <laughs> over S. It did plenty of guys out there. It's an hour. But nobody's sending it. You know? it it's <laughs> an hour of pantomime. <laughs> it's on the So. <laughs> um, I mentioned the youth program um, back. Probably four or five years ago, I was uh, at the Dayton Convention talking to Rob KCRB. By the way, um, Rob is kind of uh, uh, the father of the CW Academy program. And at the time, there was a, a two year waiting uh, list to get into the CW Academy, to get into the, the, the beginner's class. And I said, you know, it's really unfair to ask a 16 year old. To wait until he's a freshman in college before he can take a Morse code class. And Rob looked at me and he said, You're absolutely right, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> um, so we came up with this idea of a youth program where the youth could be lumped into a class with their peers. Uh, they are much less intimidated and work much better with each other if they're in a similar age group. Uh, so we have at least one class every semester that's geared towards uh, begin the beginners um, that, that has the young people in it. And we fast track. In other words, they don't have, if there's a waiting list, they don't have to wait. They basically get fast track. Um, and, and CW Academy or CW Watch has done, I know they've done a deal with MMJ for uh, discount on antennas, on these portable antennas. Um, and there are some other interesting things that, that are happening through the youth program. But I find it particularly satisfying um, because young people show no fear. Um, they want to learn this and they want to get better at it. And watching them interact with each other is really hilarious. And I've, had, I've had students where, you know, they were learning and going through the process and doing all of that. And then when we get into the week where we're doing contests, all of a sudden, they want to beat each other against the, against the side of the head. Right? In other words, as long as it was just learning, they were very attentive and very focused and learning. But once it became either them or one of the other people in the class, you know, they clearly got much more competitive about all of this. So it's, it's been very, I gotta tell you, it's tremendously rewarding. The feeling that I get when I tune across 40 meters and I and I hear one of my former students who's a teenager sitting there calling CQ on 40 meters is is just out of this world. It's really tremendous. So um, CW Academy can always use more advisors. Uh, you don't have to be a member of CW Watch to be an advisor. All you have to do is have a knowledge of Morse code and want to share it with other people. Okay, so um, we can always use more advisors. There is usually, for at least one of the programs, uh, a waiting list. Uh, that is not as significant as it used to be. It used to be several years to get to the top of the list. Now, occasionally, there'll be a student that will be pushed off for one semester because they can't get fit in. Uh, we can always use more advisors. <clears throat> I gotta say, probably, 
I know it's one of the most satisfying activities I've ever participated in uh, with regards to amateur radio. Um, if you want to sign up, go to cwops.org and you will find um, through the menus, uh, you'll find where to sign up. Um, if you have questions, uh, you can look the answers on the CW Academy website. You can email me. I'm certainly accessible by email uh, a bunch of different ways. Anybody have any questions? I know we fielded questions as we went, but I'll kind of throw it out. So, enjoy the first. Those computer programs that they should up there, do they also pick up your sending and give you an idea about what you're doing? So, so there are programs that will, that you can uh, set up so that when you send, it will either recognize or not recognize what you're sending, okay? Um, they're not so good. They're geared towards, all of these programs are geared towards machine sent code. So unless you're sending so well that the computer thinks you're sending with a machine, where your timing is perfect, it may not receive it, but that's also a good indication as to how, how you're sent. Okay. There, there's something, there's a program that's very popular now called CW Skimmer. Okay. It's used in the reverse beacon network. So if you get on the air and you call CQ, you will actually get posted online on, on a page where it says, you know, K1BG CQ 7025. Okay, so it gives my call and the frequency, okay, and the time. And that's a reverse beacon network. If you send a perfect code, the reverse beacon network will spot you. Okay. A lot of guys that are doing QRP will send like, you know, you know, a quarter of a watt kind of thing. Okay, 250 milliwatts, 100 milliwatts. They send CQ and they want to see where the beacon can hear them in the world because you know, it's almost no power at all, and you don't have to raise another hand in order to do this, right? But typically, if you're sending like by hand, we talked about hand keys earlier. If you're sending by hand, no matter how good you are, the computer programs can't recognize it because there's enough minute changes with each did and die that it just doesn't, it, it just doesn't get it. So there are programs out there that you can use to tell you how, you, how you're doing. But generally, if you send it with here and paddles, okay, most of the timing is done for you, and you're sending pretty good code to be using the here. So, All right. have you used uh, Mumble software? I have used Mumble software. Yeah. Yes, there there is a group of hams that have uh, um, where they practice Morse code over over Mumble. I do that. So does the air take people on the air? And to me, <laughs> again, if you have the on the air capability, you're not irritating people on me. I'm, I'm, I took a, I'm sorry, but I've never heard anyone say to somebody on the air that your Morse code is bad, okay? <laughs> and I know people whose Morse code, they send with bugs, they send with hands. Their code is really bad. So the few times I did go on the air, people slow down to match my speed. And, and, and by the way, the Q signals, we talked about Q signals, QRS, okay? If you send QRS to somebody, it's slow down, okay? And if they don't slow down, I would just spin the knob and go somewhere else, okay? It's, I consider it to be really um, rude to not slow down to the speed of the, the, the person you're speaking. I mean, it's, 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 just, it's just bad manners, so. What is it, mumbo? Mumble. Oh, mumble, like, like the word sound. I took a mouse, a USB mouse key, and cut it, and kept hooking it to my script key until I got the tone. So I found the two wires and made it tone. Oh, you used it as a key? Then I used that my script key, USB to the computer. And that's how I said it on the oh, on I on the line. Just use the, use the USB. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. If you could only pick one band, which one would you pick for more stuff? Well, that's like, you know, if, if, if you could pick one car, which would you pick? And, you know, one guy likes Ford and one guy likes Toyota, you know. Um, pick the band that's, that 
discuss when you decide if you're on the air at 7 o'clock at night, pick the band that has the most activity on it, right? So you have daytime bands, you have nighttime bands, you have summer bands, you have winter bands, right? I like generally like 40 meters because you can generally raise somebody on 40 meters all the time. Night and day, there's always activity, right? But I'll tell you, when band conditions improve, you know, there's no meters like 10 meters, people say, right? You know, so it just kind of depends. Yeah. And then is there anything happening on the FM bands, like 2 meter or 440? Or? So, so again, CW and FM are two different modes. Okay, so you may find CW on 2 meters, you may find CW on 440. Generally, they're only used in context on those bands, okay? There are people that will uh, have Morse code classes on repeaters. Yeah. Right. And so that's that's modulated FM, right? So it's done with FM, but they have their their uh, tier uh, sending the sounds, right? But it's still FM, as yeah. opposed to CW. So I, I've heard of practicing on FM, and I couldn't figure out how they could do it. <laughs> so a lot of times I give the presentation, we still have a few minutes left. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I came late. I went to the wrong building. Um, did you cover stuff? I mean, I, I was wondering, like, I hear the word Farnsworth. Is that a style of learning? Did you cover that already? We did. So, <laughs> Farnsworth, so when you send Morse code, it's in so many words per minute. This goes back to the old days. So, if you're sending in 20 words per minute, it's 25 letter words is one minute. Okay? By the way, Paris is considered the perfect word. I can't remember why, but it's the it's the number of dot dashes in it. Okay, so if you send like Paris 20 times in one minute, it's 20 words per minute. Okay, if you send it at five words per minute, it's those five words sent in one minute. Okay, and what happens is the timing of the dots and the dashes and the times between them. This is all kind of spelled out, right? So if you send it five words per minute, it's really slow. So a C is da, did, da, did, and at 20 words per minute, it's da, da, da. Okay? Farnsworth says you send the character at 20 words per minute, da, 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 but the spacing between the words is very so Farnsworth timing means you send the character at one speed, but the space between it is stretched out. These so are words or the characters? So this is the characters. Okay. Okay? Did I say words? Yeah. It's a, sorry, it's the characters. So essentially what happens is an effective speed of about five words per minute, even though you're sending the character at 20 words per minute. And that gives the student more time between those letters for his to recognize what the character is. And as you improve your Morse code, your recognition time improves, and so that you can start shortening that space until you get up to the 20 words per minute. So it's a learning technique? Yes. Is that what the academy uses? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so a lot of times I'll give this presentation, and it's amazing, there'll be 20, 30, 40 people in the room Nobody asks questions. So I, to kind of spur a little interest, come up with my own series of questions. People will ask me, what's the secret to learning Morse code? Practice. Practice a little every day, okay? Try to be consistent. I tell my students, you all got smartphones, right? Pick a time, put an alarm in the phone. When the alarm goes off, you practice for half an hour, okay? By the way, you can break that up. It doesn't have to be continuous, 45 minutes or an hour. Break it up into 15 minute session. But I tell my students, don't burn out. I've had kids come to me and say, Bruce, you know, I practiced two hours yesterday. Stop. You know, after after a certain period of time, you pass the point of diminishing returns. Don't don't do it. Well, I wanted to make up because I couldn't do it the day before. And it's like try to do it every day, right? Is there a best way to learn the Morse code? Anybody who's ever taught to a, a taught a, uh, ever worked with a, in special education, okay, will tell you that there are many, many, many ways, okay, to teach a subject.
subject. And I don't want to tell you that there is a best way. The best way to learn the Morse code is the way that works for you. Okay? And there are other programs that are out there. I will say that CW Academy is tried and true. Okay? It works for the broad majority of people. Okay? There are also bad ways to learn Morse code. Any way that doesn't focus on the sound, any way where you're encouraged word association, you're encouraged to count dips and dots, anything where you're not focused on the sound is a bad way to learn the Morse code, in my opinion. What other programs are out there? So there's a bunch of them. Uh, there's something called um, Long Island CW Club, okay? Um, their program is also online, but it's a little bit different. They run ongoing classes all the time. It's not like broken into a semester kind of thing. And they run classes every day. So if you take a class today at, at the class at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, Tomorrow you might want to take the class at 8 o'clock at night and you get 20 or 30 people in the class sometimes and it's kind of an ongoing kind of thing. It's a pay for thing, there's a subscription. You either pay and become a life member or you have to buy an annual membership for doing, uh, for doing Long Island CW Club. There's um, an online site called LCWO, Learn CW Online, that seems to be popular. Uh, I think they use what's called the Koch method, okay? And the Koch method, uh, you send with Ferenc's work, that's still an important part, but with the Koch method, they introduce one character at a time. And you keep going through this online program, and once you get proficient in all of the letters that talk to that point, then they introduce one new letter, okay? At least that's the way I believe it works. Um, so, and there are other programs that are out there, but again, uh, I strongly encourage you to focus on the ones where you're, you're, you really learn, learn the sound as opposed to anything else. Um, CW, Brad, does that differ? Uh, introduces one letter at a time to the point where you've got them all, uh, one character at a time. Does that differ from, uh, from from CW Academy? So CW Academy typically we meet twice a week yeah. and there is four letters. There is I, somewhere between two and four letters okay. introduced each time. Okay. okay. Um, if you want additional resources, you can find information on all these things I've talked about uh, on the CW on the CW Office uh, website under CW resources. So any, any other questions? Anything? We've got a few minutes. Anything you'd like to talk about? So, when you were talking about Farnsworth and uh, some of the other stuff, you were concentrating on the, the spacing between letters. Is there also spacing between words so you know when they're going to end word? So, again, um, I can't remember now exactly, exactly what it is. So, a did is considered one time. Okay, so and again, depending on the speed, that kind of changes, right? But you have a dit sound and a da sound. A da is three times a dit. Okay. Um, I can't, I can't remember the, the spacing. There's a certain spacing. Do you, do you I don't know an exact ratio, but there is a longer space. So there's a once you get in that rhythm. You know that, you know, like Bruce just said, three bits is the same time frame as it takes to send a dot. Right. Okay, so you get that at the Farnsworth speed, let's say, all right, then you're automatically going to start recognizing the end of a word because you haven't heard any other sound. So you do pause longer at the end of a word than you do in between the letters. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. If not, it would just all run. run well, that's what I was wondering. Like, how do you know whether it's a or whether we didn't get the word out. You know, it, and not everybody does give you that. Go ahead and your time. One second on the timing of the level of test 
that when you say testing, that like a test to see if you graduated kind of thing? No, they're testing to get a license. Oh, to get a, to get a license? So there's no more scope requirement for getting a license anymore. Okay. So this is just purely a program to help people to help people learn learn the, learn the more learn the more scope so they can use it on the air. Okay, but the expectation is to be on the air and you have to have a license to do that. You have to have a license to get on the air, correct. Now I've had a number of students who are unlicensed take my program and that's not a problem. It makes it difficult for them to get on the air and use it, okay? But for instance, um, I've had a number of students come to me and learn the code first and get a uh, license to have it, okay? I had a class of eight students recently where one of the 10 year olds in the class um, was fanatical about everything Titanic and excited his classmates. And so eight of them took the class in Morse code to me. And and actually, two of them were interested in getting license, but at 10 years old, the technician class license for 10 years old is challenging. Okay, um, but nevertheless, I think there are some future answers that are there. So there are students that take the class that aren't licensed, but um, that's that's generally not the rule. Well, it was something that's bothered me for a long time. Actually, our clerk was teaching too. That was the kid who was a novice license. Correct. Everybody was a beginner. Everybody made the same mistakes. So you felt comfortable when you made the mistakes that you all made them. You know, and you got this practice time. You had to upgrade within a year. You had a year to make mistakes and to learn from your mistakes. And that's how you learn things. Something that bothers me all today is we talk very briefly about uh, pro signs. People don't use them, they don't know what they are. And when you were not, you had to do that. And those things, by the way, mean. I'm finished with this, but I'm saying now it's your turn to go ahead. Those things seem to be absent. So, so where do you learn those things? And where it seems to be there's no place that there's a lot of all, all beginners in the world to learn from things. So uh, again, this is way off on another subject. You know, I also, and I alluded to this at the beginning of the talk, I also do talk on the history of entry level licensing in this country what the requirements were to get a license. You know, there was a time when you had to know the Morse code, for instance. Um, but in my opinion, you know, the elimination of the novice license and also the, the what they call rearming the novice subdomains, the places where the novices went to operate, it was a great training ground because everybody was learning, right? And so you ran into lots of people at slower speeds and all of that kind of thing. That doesn't exist anymore. So that, that's what I was trying to say. It's too bad. There are hangers, you know, like on 40 meters around uh, above uh, 7040, for you know, 10, 20 kilohertz above that. And then up around uh, the old novice, but just below the old novice band, 7100, and then up a little bit is slower speeds. There's also some next there. They still have to swim on the floor. Yeah. Do yeah. they still have the uh, Thunder Bay transmissions? There were three or four times a week at each. There was, if you go online, you see slow speed, medium, and fast. So, so there are still those kinds of things. ARL still transmits code practice daily, five, seven and a half, ten, right. 13, 15 words per minute. There's a whole range. This one was on the Thunder Bay up there. Uh, so I, I don't know. I know with the ARL, you can also go to their website and all the files that they use on the air. They also store those, so you can play with that. There's MP3 files if you like. Um, there are lots of those kinds of um, places where you can find slower code in practice. If you wanted to sign up for CW Academy, um, you say it's a semester. Right, so if you go to the website now and sign up, you fill in your call sign stuff. There's also, by the way, if you don't want to take the beginner's level, there's a place where you can go and it says, copy, copy this transmission. And if you can, if you can, if you can't copy it, it says you should be in this class. And if you can copy it, it says you should be in this class kind of thing. So, that's not my, that's not going to apply to me. But uh, if you went and signed up now, Okay, then they would sign you up for I think the next semester's 
starts in either January or February. And, and if you were to do that, then you, what basic, what the minimum of equipment you should have? You say that paddle is a question. Paddle? Yeah. You need a paddle, you need a keer of some kind for making the sound. Okay. okay. That can either be a side cone in the transceiver or a standalone keer. And then you need a computer, and you need internet access, and a microphone, and a camera. So, like, if you have a laptop like this, you have the computer, you have the microphone, you have the camera. Um, we've got an internet connection because we're uh, sending this on, on YouTube, and then you just need a paddle for sending and a keyer for making the sound. <coughs> I want to clear a couple of things up uh, with a paddle. You need the IM. Doesn't have to be iambic, it's just recommended that you have a panel for the this the sending that we're talking about. The key here, the no smarts, and you, you can adjust the like in, in, in the radios, you can no matter how long you hold that key, it's gonna make the right thing dash it up. Correct. The timing in most mod in modern keyers is all is all yeah. figured out. Yeah. Uh, what brand of bottles are you keeping for your keys? So like what kind of car do you want to drive? Um, most of my most of my students that are not using keyers that are built in their transceivers, they're typically using one of the MFJ keyers. There's there's lots of them out there. Um, they're small. They make enough audio sound so that they're easily heard over Zoom. Okay. I've had students try crazy little junk keyers. Okay. I've had students try crazy junk paddles. Um, and, and I'll tell you, it's, a, it's, a, it's hard enough learning the code, okay? You don't want to throw extra challenges in. Um, I've had students say to me, well, Bruce, I'm going to learn Morse code and I'm going to do QRP operation. That's why I want Morse code, to do low power, right? And I say, well, I say, remember, Morse code is a challenge. QRP is a challenge. Okay? When I was a kid, if you had problems at home, you ran away and you, and you joined the circus. And my advice to you if you join the circus is don't try to juggle and learn the high wire at the same time. Okay? Because the two of them together, they make a challenge really challenging. Right? So, if you want to do QRP, that's great. If you want to learn Morse code, that's great. Learn how to do those two things, combine them together, that's great. But to just be a brand new operator for the first time, just learning the code and just getting set up and you set up a QRP stage, that can be a little challenging. So, QRP is low power. Okay. Okay, so if you're, you know, most transceivers, modern transceivers are 100 watts output. QRP is typically five watts, five watts or less. So it makes making contacts a little bit more challenging, but if you develop your operating skills, then you get a thrill out of making those contacts. How are we doing time wise? We have about five minutes. Okay, the session is supposed to start, so. Uh, oh, yeah. All right. Um, that's introducing another challenge to my case. Correct. I, I got away from my habit. I had a paddle. finally got a the galley um, Leonessa, which can do either. Um, they're rare. I mean, uh, and just like the keyers, separate keyers are getting rare. So, my advice to students okay, is I've been using an iambic paddle for the better part of 50 years. Does everyone know what an iambic paddle is versus a regular paddle? No. Okay, a regular paddle. Basically, it's a single pole, double throw switch. So you either ground the dot side, where you go did it, did it, did it, or you ground the dash side, where you go da 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 da. But it's one, it's one lever. Okay. An iambic paddle is two levers, so it's two single pole switches. This one goes da 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 da, goes did it, did it, did it, did it, did Go. This one goes da 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 da, and you can let it go. But if you do both of them at the same time, and either goes da 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 da, or it goes da 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 da, by the start 
with a div, it starts with a dash, and I don't want to get into all the iambic A and iambic B and all this kind of stuff. The original theory with iambic was that if you could just squeeze both of them together, there were less finger movements. So if you were making a C, rather than going die to die with it, you would just go die to die. Okay? Somebody actually did an analysis of this, and the amount of movement that you say is almost zero. Okay, it's insignificant. I shoot myself, that's it. I'm not going to do it. And also, the vast majority of the QRQ guys that operate 50, 60, 70 words a minute that use paddles, they're not using the squeeze paddles. They're doing, they're doing the, the single lever. Okay? So, so there's a real argument what's better. The vast majority of the paddles out there are the only paddles. And what I tell my students is do exactly what I'm doing. Okay? Use the iambic paddle. Don't bother trying to learn how to squeeze key. Don't even bother, okay? There's also another thing. If someday you want to get into things like, by the way, I, I tell people, you know, we, we teach using paddles. We recommend not using a hand key. I'm not against hand keys. I own four or five spectacular hand keys that I use regularly. I own a World War II J38. I, yeah, I own a Russian Army okay, hand key. I love them, okay? And I tell people, I'm not against them, but there's a difference between learning how to drive, okay, on a modern car and learning how to drive on a Model T. You wouldn't want to practice to get your driver's license on a Model T or a, or a 29 Dodge where you have, you know, on the column shift and you have to double clutch. That's not what you want to learn about. Okay, and the same thing is true, true with hand keys. Um, but if you ever want to learn how to use uh, a bug, okay, a bug is a single lever device. If you learn how to squeeze key, the guys who squeeze key and then try to go to a bug, oh, they're, they're, they're lost. It's really hard. So, this is what I do. I never learn how to use the squeeze key function. I use I use dynamic paddles all the time, and I just send them as if it's a single single. Uh, I'm trying to play back in my head what I'm remembering uh, the the, uh, the the ratio of the W one A W set, and I'm thinking that they're not doing the boards for they, they I don't know when they change. They are, everything they do is now fine. It is. It is. Um, in terms of answering someone uh, that's calling CQ and it's not hard work, is it proper etiquette to send in the same character spacing as they are? Not character spacing, but you know. that's, what, that's what I do. You, you actually, in actuality, Hear very little parts where the slower speeds are in the air. Okay. Even though it even though it's taught that way. And I will tell you that people have come back to me and said, Bruce, you know, your sentence is so easy to understand. Okay. And I think, in my opinion, there are an obscene number of mistakes when I send. Okay. But people come back to me and say, Well, wow, you, your code is so easy to understand. It's because even if I'm sending it 25 or 30 words per minute, I tend to have a little burns worth built into what I send. So I send the character a little bit faster than the, the spacing that's between the characters, and it just makes it easier, easier to, to understand. It's probably helping that. So, so Bruce, it's not clicking. Are you saying use a two paddle here? A, a no, um, two or one. Hang on. Okay. Uh, I, Let's I, see. The so, you see this panel? Yeah. True. This is an iambic panel. One side makes dots, one side makes dashes. But isn't that two panels? No. This is this. They'll call them panels because there's two here. But this is this is one device. All right, but there are there are ones that have one lever. Sure. But that's not. But, but again, again, if I'm sending with this, 
If you only have one here, if you push it this way, if you push it that way, da 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 da. The only difference is with this, I can squeeze them, and so they're connected both at the same time. Right. And that's what you recommend. I recommend what works best for you, but I'm telling you that that's what you there's probably in every single lever panel you'll find out there, like if you buy these used. There's probably 30 iambic paths, 40 iambic paths. All of the common, all of the common paths that are out there are iambic. Yeah. And you're saying if CW Ops uses a paddle, but you need a key or to make sound. This so is you're just not this is just a switch. Yeah. So you this is like a light switch doesn't make any sounds. If you attach your light switch to a key or you threw it, then you hear did it, did it, did it, did it, did it, okay. This is just a switch. Yeah. So are you, I, I think you had mentioned connecting a USB to the panel so that you could use your computer for That's something? That's online. Yeah, online. So, well, so you'd have to actually buy a, yes. a sound generator. Yes. You can't. You can't. You can't. I'll tell you, uh, I wanted to code for a long time, in 1964. And I used uh, one side of the plug because it was just less strain like you're talking about carpet. All right, so I had the little coffin bug that had Bobby and Baby had. And I didn't use the bump side very often. Then I wanted to use a key. And you know, that was even before my ambic was introduced. So uh, my place had a, a paddle that was uh, went out and squeezed. Okay. Then I said, you know, well, my, my college friends here, they're all like super fast. They said, get, a, get an iambic key, uh, key. And I said, okay, I'll try it. So that I can, in their minds, go faster with the squeeze. You start with the thumb and it's supposed to da 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 You start with the, the, this side, it goes da 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 And I found, you know, if I just like not pay attention to what my fingers are doing, I get an extra did ah when I go for it. And, and, and it like made the mistakes. I said, finally that's it. So I went to uh, the galley, what the Leonessa, which goes either iambic or, or single paddle, and, and I said it improved. So it's a personal thing. You know, what you can do with your mind and your fingers, I just don't like the sweets. That's my first, personal preference. Somebody first starting out, all you can buy is an MFJ key. And it has a sound that, you know, you, you can turn up the sound and you listen to it. I don't see them selling a paddle, an ambic paddle. Well, they, the MFJ they, has, they has one. Have, no, and the MFJ has two iambic paddles. One of them is excellent. One of them, in my opinion, is the worst piece of junk you want to find out. Okay. So, um, to each, to each their own. They sell this little portable paddle that looks kind of like junk, and they sell another paddle that's a, uh, a copy, um, I don't want to say a copy, but similar to um, the Venture B BY1 paddles. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you have a, uh, a Venture paddle, all you need to do is buy a gear? So all you need to do is you own a Venture paddle, Buy it here, or if you have a transceiver with a side tone, okay. Look at the instruction manual on how to put it in your practice mode, where you're actually not transmitting RF over the air, but you're just using the side side tone that's in the transceiver. That's what most of my students do. They don't buy a separate um, keyer; they just use the built-in keyer in the transceiver. All right. Thank you, everybody. You've been a great audience. Again, Very feel free to email me. Um, if you want to join CW Academy, go to the website and uh, thank you very much. Thank you to my producer. <laughs> How do we get you as an instructor? Uh, send me an email. You got a local radio? Oh, oh, as an instructor, me as an instructor. So go to go to CW Academy and sign up. You can request me. I can not do mostly the kids these days. So. Oh, okay. good. So, <laughs> who does the old folks? <laughs>